What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? Please don't click away yet. God damn it. Look, I have this irrational fear that you're hearing this opening bit and you're like, this is what the rest of the video is going to sound like. Fuck that. But that's not true. I promise we're going to talk about the coolest, uh, best video games out, out there in the sphere right now. Here's one uh, fresh for you r right now. Silent Hill is... boy. Yeah, never has the formatting of my opening sentence felt so redundant. And never have I felt more unqualified to talk about something, but... I don't know, I'm gonna do it anyway. I get that you probably know what it is, and that you've probably heard most of what I'm about to say in preamble countless times, but for the sake of uniformity, Silent Hill is a third-person survival horror game, developed by Konami and published by Konami in February of 1999. Six years prior though, a little-known sleeper hit from Capcom, probably haven't heard of it, kind of an underground cult hit, would be released called Resident? evil, and prompting a number of developers to drum up their own survival horror game in hopes of mimicking Capcom's international success. Mere months after the release of Resident Evil, a team of disenchanted Konami employees, which I like to think is most of them nowadays, would be assembled. They were headed by composer and sound director Akira Yamaoka, who was hired as a composer but muscled his way into taking over sound design and voice direction as well, director and producer Keiichiro Toyama, an untested 26-year-old developer who impressed Konami with his work on the motion capture for a track and field game, so was handed a director role, background designer Masahiro Ito, who wound up designing the creatures after impressing Toyama with his art, and graphic artist Takayoshi Sato, who, despite being gifted at 3D modeling, was initially forced to tackle smaller tasks, like fonts and organizing files. This was mostly because he was younger and Konami is a very traditional Japanese corporation. This led him to going over his boss's head and presenting a 3D cutscene to some higher-ups, essentially flexing, look, this is what I'm capable of, if you don't let me do this, I won't tell the rest of these dummies how to do it. This gamble would pay off as he was allowed to design all the characters in Silent Hill, make changes to its story, and create the cutscenes. Konami, still bitter about needing this boy's expertise, tried to assign him a supervisor, meaning that he would not be credited for doing all of the work he was actually doing. To avoid this, he chose to take on all the CG work on his own, requiring him to essentially live in the team's offices for three years, rendering the animations on everyone's PCs when they went home for the night. Even though the catalyst for Silent Hill's creation was somewhat corporate, and the team had not previously worked on or had much interest in horror, they would operate with relative artistic freedom from Konami, taking the instruction of make a survival horror game because that is clearly what is profitable at this point in time, and rifling through what he found frightening, Toyama decided that his appreciation for the occult, UFOs, the films of David Lynch, and the writings of Stephen King would form the foundation of this new project. He would also take into account what made Resident Evil effective, its tension and atmosphere, but he also criticized how its sequels strayed from what made the original enjoyable, and felt that they wandered into B-movie territory. So the focus of Silent Hill would be on psychological horror and fear of the unknown, intentionally pushing the genre both visually and conceptually on a console that was rapidly approaching the end of its lifespan. In 1998, a cinematic trailer with some gameplay debuted at E3, which so impressed attendees that they applauded it, rousing Konami from its comfortable seat atop a pile of gold coins with the frenzying stink of money, inspiring them to toss some coins for advertising and incidentals at the team they probably forgot was still there. The game would also debut a playable demo at a computer trade show in London, uh, but its presence was eclipsed by Konami's other upcoming title, Metal Gear Solid, with IGN taking a jab at it saying it's just too darn foggy. Upon its release, it sold very well and was reviewed very well. Unfortunately, there were unavoidable comparisons to Resident Evil 2, which had come out a few months before. GamePro would call it a shameless but slick Resident Evil clone, and GameSpot would remark Konami's first entry in the horror genre, while not quite up to the mark of Capcom's Resident Evil 2, is a great beginning. Reviews like this from big names would perpetuate its image as a good Resident Evil clone, but in the years after its release, appreciation for Silent Hill would grow and it would wind up being re-released as part of PlayStation's greatest hits line. Silent Hill's legacy endures. If I type in scariest horror games, what's the first thing you're gonna get? Look at that, it's not even accompanied by any games from the decade it was released. And then, you know, just for funsies, I was wondering, where do some of the lesser entries in the series rank? 
Like, where's Silent Hill Homecoming? It's not gonna be like number 10, like, it's gotta be somewhere in the 30s, right? So just for fun, uh, we could respond with, Silent Hill does rule, but what game would be number 34? Then we, uh, go ahead and check out our results here and fuck me. So Silent Hill means a lot to me, and I know it's obvious material for my channel. It's like, well, of course I'd cover this game. It's, it's so on brand. But I have such reverence for it, not only for its place in video game history, but for its place in the development of my appreciation for video games and music and film that I didn't feel worthy to contribute my voice to its discourse. You know, you could hear about this game from an endless number of more qualified and reputable sources. But then I realized, Fuck it. <laughs> the first thing that was clear about Silent Hill's plot was that it was going to be modern and it was going to be American. Toyama would initially entertain the idea of making the project an adaptation of Stephen King's The Mist, even going as far as trying to negotiate rights, which turned out to be a headache and the idea was abandoned. He was also taken by the idea of drawing inspiration from H.P. Lovecraft's The Shadow Over Innsmouth, but that idea would be shelved and used later for Siren. With neither of these panning out, they would begin to craft an original story. The stagnation of the project wound up informing their approach to its design. Given that they were a team of inexperienced game designers and had trouble coming up with a cohesive, consistent plot, they decided to play into that vagueness, to draw from the absurd dream logic of David Lynch and Alejandro Jodorowsky. This vagueness allows for a story that is sometimes challenging, that often contradicts itself. Depending on how you play, you could miss whole scenes, and sometimes you just can't make heads or tails of it. Based on certain actions you take, you will also get one of four possible endings, which could all be valid conclusions. Two of them would have to be somewhat canonical as the game does have a direct sequel and prequel. But the first four Silent Hill games never seem to be all that worried about having a clear, concise timeline. So I'll summarize up until we know our full cast of characters and have a basic idea of what's going on. And then we'll pause and you can decide if you want to continue hearing the rest of it or if you'd like to experience the game on your own. We'll take a little break. I'm, I'm sure we'll need it. Um, I certainly will because I haven't even started describing the story and already my hands are shaking. That usually doesn't start until around 3 a.m. when, uh, when they come for me. My secret visitors. It's a hard story to explain in a simple A, B, C structure. It's like A happens, and then there's a bunch of letters you can't quite make out, and then F happens. And there aren't definite answers to what some of those letters were. I mean, some of it's addressed in sequels, but like, I'm gonna treat this as if th those don't exist yet. It's 1999 right now. This is all we have. Can you picture it? Video games were good. You could bring a knife onto a plane. That, those are the only differences. Silent Hill begins with Harry Mason and his daughter Cheryl, driving to the resort town that is the game's namesake for a vacation. A police motorcycle speeds past them, and a little further he notices the same bike abandoned on the side of the road. At this moment, a woman steps in front of their vehicle, causing Harry to swerve, and he winds up crashing his car in a ditch. Waking up some time later, it has started to snow, and Cheryl is no longer in the passenger seat. He stumbles out of the wreck and sets out to find her. You're not given any expository setup or background on these characters, you're just thrown into ostensibly a cold open, which is really effective. The opening moments of this game are burned into my memory. It's part of my genetic code like Skinny Puppy's first album, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and that time I hit my head really hard and spoke to a soldier from the Civil War, Harry enters Silent Hill, finding it seemingly devoid of life and draped in a near blinding fog. We catch glimpses of a figure that looks like Cheryl, but she runs further into town while Harry gives chase. He is led to an alley where the sky suddenly darkens and a distant alarm sounds. Stumbling around the darkened alley, it becomes more unnerving, decorated with rusty metal grating, hospital beds, piles of various undefinable gore. Reeling from this discovery, he turns to leave but is confronted by several small creatures that latch onto him until he passes out. He wakes up sometime later in a diner where he is introduced to Sybil Bennett the police officer who passed him on the road to town. She is just as confused about the state of Silent Hill as Harry, and tells us all communication with any of the neighboring towns is down, and she plans to leave for reinforcements. She protests in vain against Harry wandering off on his own to look for his daughter, but quickly relents leaving him with a gun, something police officers very rarely do. Trust me, <laughs> they won't give that thing up no matter how nice you ask. They'll get mad at you. As Harry heads out of the diner, a radio begins to emit static, drawing his attention and causing him to utter the immortal words, Huh. Radio. 
What's going on with that radio? Just then, a winged creature crashes through the window and attacks Harry, revealing that the radio seems to respond to the presence of these otherworldly creatures. Returning to the alley where he last saw Cheryl, he finds a torn page from her schoolbook that reads simply, to school. Midwich Elementary is no different than the rest of the town. Empty, save for unsettling creatures. In this case, ones that appear to reflect the twisted visage of school children. Entering a clock tower in the school's courtyard, he again finds himself transported to the dark, hostile, alternate Silent Hill, where the new courtyard is stamped with this sinister-looking symbol, and the hallways are lined with rusty metal grating and chains. This also leads to one of the most disquieting moments in video game history. Cheryl! Like, that, that's not something I was okay with in 1999. There is something truly brutal about this moment that exceeds whatever gore had been shown until this point. Just that moment of silence as Harry has to deal with hearing his daughter pleading for his help? Fuck that. <laughs> While trying to navigate the warped school, he comes across a children's book that tells the story of a brave hunter who defeats a giant lizard by shooting an arrow into its mouth. We also find some assorted notes left in blood that tell of a darkness that brings the choking heat. Which, if you're a, a smarty, this would lead you to, uh, think to inspect the school's boiler room, which leads to a large room with a burning figure in the center and a massive lizard that he fights, eventually defeating it with a shot in the mouth. Uh, as the creature dies, Harry passes out again and comes to in what appears to be a perfectly ordinary boiler room. Glimpsing a young girl in the dark, she locks eyes with him before her ghostly image fades away. With no sign of Cheryl, Harry gives up his search and heads back out into the street, where the toll of church bells can be heard. So, and you're never gonna catch me saying this in literally any other scenario in life, but I guess we should head to the church. At the church, he meets a mysterious and eccentric older woman named Dahlia Gillespie. She clearly has some knowledge of what is going on here, but speaks in riddles and Harry can't really follow because he's just a simple little peach. What are you talking about? He's just a regular man. Johnny Normal over here. Can't get with the program. She says in order to find the girl, he needs to follow the path and make haste to the hospital, leaving him with an occult object called the Flowros. So I guess we're going to the hospital. Uh, another thing you're not going to catch me saying, as I do live in the United States. At the hospital, we meet and are almost murdered by Michael Kaufman, a brusque and frank-speaking doctor who seems about as unsure of what's going on as Harry, but he does seem to be handling it a little better than him. I've always loved this moment when you walk in on him. It's one of many striking images. The way he's just sitting and staring at this creature he just killed, almost like he's trying to process the reality of it. In his office, Harry finds the spilled remains of a red liquid, which he scoops up into a bottle with no real motivation for doing so. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know why he does it. I know why I do it. I don't know why he does it. It's just a stain on the floor. I don't mean to, uh, speak an ill word of Silent Hill, but Harry might just be a weirdo. Maybe he's not as normie as I thought. Maybe I've made an error and I've misjudged him. I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. We get a vision of that same girl from the boiler room entering an antique store, when Silent Hill once again transitions to the other world. This time much more subtly, you just sort of step out of the elevator and here we are. We endure attacks from twisted, deformed nurses looking for any trace of Cheryl or whatever we're supposed to do with this 3D Triforce. In the basement, which took some work to get to, Harry finds a room that looks as though it's been recently disturbed. On the bedside we see a photo of a very familiar looking young girl and learn her name is Alessa. After this we finally complete our cast of characters by meeting Lisa Garland, a nurse who is experiencing some memory loss and has locked herself in an examination room to wait things out. Unlike the other characters, Lisa is visibly terrified and seems to be the most confused by the nightmare that Silent Hill has become. They have a brief exchange before a familiar siren starts to blare and Harry has an intense headache, causing him to pass out. When he comes to, he's still in the hospital and Silent Hill has returned to its normal, less nightmarish, more foggy self. Lisa is gone, but Dahlia Gillespie shows up and chastises you for being too late. Ever incomprehensible, she warns that the Mark of Samael 
must not be complete, alluding to that symbol we glimpsed in the Otherworld Elementary School. Otherwise, Silent Hill will be devoured by darkness. She leaves him this time with a key to the antique shop, so we head on over there. I should mention, in the hospital, and by exploring other areas in town, we do pick up on little tidbits and writings and newspaper and so forth that add some new pieces to the puzzle, like the Silent Hill Police Department's attempts to halt the production and sale of a hallucinogenic drug called PTV which is made from a certain indigenous flower called White Claudia. The investigations led to the mysterious deaths of a mayor who had a staunch anti-drug stance, and a narcotics officer named Thomas Gucci, who strangely enough plays a decent-sized role in the film adaptation. He kinda replaces the significance of the character Travis from the game's eventual prequel, even though Travis is then alluded to in the ending to the adaptation's sequel, but then what does it matter when the character has been replaced by this guy? What does any of this matter? We're all gonna die. Do you get all of your clothes from Goodwill? <laughs> Are you following so far? It's okay if it just feels like a series of disjointed scenes. You know about as much as they want you to know. We got some interesting leads, some intriguing characters, we have an assortment of puzzle pieces but no picture on the box, and they all seem to be of various sizes, and you're wondering if this was a manufacturing error or just a very whimsical puzzle. How long am I going to stretch out this puzzle metaphor? Anyway, if you'd like to come to your own conclusions on things and experience the game for yourself, feel free to skip to this time where I will conclude my feelings on the plot. And uh, while we wait, I can try to address every error I've ever made in my videos. Uh, where do we start? <laughs> I called Beckett from Vampire the Masquerade a werewolf. He is not. He is a strain of vampire that can also be a wolf when he wants to. I know, fuck me, I confused a man who turns into a wolf with a man that turns into a wolf. Uh, I thought the falling man on Mist's box art was the protagonist, but it's most likely Atris. I believe I said that Alone in the Dark 2 was developed by Interplay, but they were only responsible for porting it to the 3DO. In my Darkseed video, I referred to H.R. Giger as a Swedish painter, and he is in fact Swiss. I unknowingly read a speedrun walkthrough for my Thief video and complained about a leap of faith that was in fact not necessary. Uh, people tell me I was supposed to stay away from windows and dark wood, but that never seemed to change the difficulty of the night sequences. Like, it's a hard game and I tried just about every configuration you could. I think those are the major ones. Um, one time I tried to prove that walking simulators were games by reading the definition of video games, which was a flimsy argument. There's more, probably, but uh, I just want you to know I'm aware of all of them. And they do keep me awake at night. Every single goddamn one of them. Anywho, I'm gonna go into like extraneous detail recounting this game because like I want to. So are you guys ready? Let's go. So back at that antique shop we saw in our brief vision, Harry uncovers a secret room behind a bookshelf and Sybil shows up, noticeably without the cavalry she promised. That's okay. Apparently, all the roads out of town are blocked, and she couldn't find a means of leaving. When asked if she has seen Cheryl, she remarks that she has seen a little girl, but doesn't know if it was Cheryl, and also she was floating above a lake. He tries to broach the subject of the nightmarish Otherworld and meeting Lisa, but she clearly has no idea what he's talking about, so he drops it and heads into the secret room while she backs him up. Inside, he finds an altar that erupts into flames. He again loses consciousness, leaving a confused Sybil still waiting for him to give the okay. He comes to back at the hospital with Lisa, as if hardly any time had passed since he initially met her. Harry remarks that she doesn't look well, but she waves the comment away and proceeds to give us the most substantial bit of exposition in the entire game. He asks her about Dahlia, who she describes as notoriously unstable following the rumored death of her daughter in a fire. Prior to Silent Hill becoming a pleasant resort town, its inhabitants were associated with some kind of old occult religion. As the town grew, knowledge of this cult began to fade until it was mostly ghost stories, though the last time there was any word of them was during the drug trafficking murders. In the middle of her story, Harry loses consciousness once more and wakes up in the Otherworld version of the antique shop. It's around here that he starts to express his frustration and confronts the possibility that everything that's happening could very well be in his head. He's experiencing what feels like an unending nightmare, so what are the chances he's really flatlining on a hospital bed somewhere? Pulling himself together, he fights his way back to Lisa in hopes that she knows how he can get to the lake that Sybil mentioned. Along the way, he is further taunted with Cheryl's frightened image on some TV screens. And, um, 
Okay, so pretty much the rest of the plot points involving Lisa are sort of rough for me because, as I said earlier, this was a formative, important game in my development, and that extends beyond making me appreciate video games from a technical or storytelling standpoint. I think this might be the first time I wept for a video game. So not only was it, wow, video games can evoke a strong emotional reaction for me, but I didn't really know I was capable of reacting to something that strongly. To be so moved by something that liquid would be expelled from my looking balls. Like, I shit you not, I had tears streaming from my face just describing this moment to someone. Because look, so far Lisa has been the most human and the most affected. Harry is freaking out, doubting reality, but most of the time he is stoically searching for his daughter. Sybil seems capable of looking after herself, same with Kaufman. They all express confusion and concern, but you find Lisa hiding under a desk. She's the only one that is visibly terrified, so much so that the first time she sees Harry, she throws her arms around him because it's another person. She almost does the same thing when you make it back to her. She is elated that Harry came back and you can sense that comfort and safety slip away as she realizes that he's going to leave her again to look for Cheryl. Lisa, can you tell me how to get to the lake? The lake? You take Bachman Road. The road's blocked. Well, that's the only way out there. And she pleads with him to stay because she's afraid, refusing to go with him because she feels like she's not supposed to leave the hospital. So with new information on how to find the lake, he leaves her miserable and alone. After trekking through the sewers, Harry emerges into the resort area of town. Here you can uncover some story beats that will determine the ending you get. If you're going for the good plus ending, which is essentially canon, you can stop by a bar where you walk in on Kaufman being attacked by a dog. Saving him begins a brief side mission, because after he thanks Harry and they share some words, he heads back out but leaves behind a hotel key and the combination to a lock on a store nearby. At the store, he finds a safe filled with PT and instructions for drop-offs at a hotel room. At this hotel room, we find more references to the drug traffickers, and a vial of red liquid similar to the kind we found in Kaufman's office. Speaking of Kaufman, he does not like that you found that vial. He marches in and snatches it out of Harry's hands, and threatens him before storming off, leaving a confused Harry to conclude that he definitely played some role in the drug trafficking ring, and that the contents of that bottle is probably dope. He's probably gonna go smoke some drugs with his deadbeat buddies over by the quarry. Back on track to the lake, we once again cross over to the other world, this time much more abruptly, and Harry's becoming increasingly concerned at how quickly these crossovers happen. Taking refuge in a boat, we meet up with Sybil who figured this would be where he was headed. At this point, Harry doesn't know much of the specifics of what's going on here, but he's arrived at the conclusion that the other world is a projection of a nightmare that is growing more powerful, and as Dahlia said, would eventually consume the town entirely. Sybil, of course, thinks he's tired and grief-stricken, but the conversation is interrupted by Dahlia, who confirms that the seal is almost complete. And once it is, it's gonna be not good. Bucko. <laughs> the only way to save Cheryl and prevent the town from being lost in the other world forever is to stop the demon that has taken the form of a child. She gives them two locations they need to go to stop her, a lighthouse and an amusement park. Sybil, still not quite sure what to think, agrees to help if there is the possibility of saving Harry's daughter. Harry arrives at the lighthouse in time to see that Alessa has completed the seal there, and she vanishes before he can I, I don't I don't know what his plan was, to fucking throw a shoe at her. So his last shot is the amusement park, where Sybil was headed. A cut scene shows an unknown assailant knocking her out with a blow to the head. When we get to the amusement park, we find Sybil the though she is clearly under the influence of some kind of power, as she stumbles around with red eyes, raising her gun and firing wildly at Harry. In a moment that, again, I'm not sure why this character is led to do this, but he does, Harry throws the bottle of liquid we collected in Kaufman's office on Sybil, which seems to expel whatever entity was controlling her. As she recovers, she asks Harry why they wanted his daughter. He says that he doesn't know, but that he and his late wife adopted Cheryl after finding her abandoned on the side of the road. So she may very well have a connection to Silent Hill. This I think was a much better timed reveal of that information than having Cheryl scream Silent Hill in her nightmares. 
Harry finally confronts Alessa and unwittingly activates the Flowros, which disables whatever magic force Alessa was using to protect herself and traps her in place. While he's trying to get some answers out of her, Dahlia appears and reveals that she is Alessa's mother, and she's been manipulating Harry to help trap her after she escaped some sort of spell. The two of them disappear and Harry wakes up back in the hospital with Lisa once more. Lisa tells Harry that she went into the basement, where he had earlier found the photo of Alessa, and she doesn't know why, but she feels like she's been there. When he tries to console her, she becomes upset and storms out. We catch up with her in the basement where... This fucking scene, first of all, this is probably why I have feelings sometimes. I could have lived in blissful numbness if it weren't for this. So she says she's figured out why she's still alive while everyone else is dead. It's because she's just like them. Meaning, I'm assuming here, because it's just, it's just how I interpret it. The monsters, the nightmare manifestations, if you will. She's just like them, but has been unaware of it until now. Begging Harry to help her, he pushes her away and recoils as she begins to bleed profusely, still trying in vain to get him to comfort her. He leaves the room and holds the door closed as she feebly pounds on it. Every detail of this breaks my heart, and the depression cherry on top is Harry sympathetically saying her name while he's holding the door closed, in a way that suggests, like, is that still you? <laughs> All right, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go make a phone call. Forget putting away for the future. This is instant money now. Okay, so you go back in the room and Lisa is gone, but her diary is on the floor. Inside it, it is inferred that Lisa looked after Alessa while she was in the hospital basement and was so terrified of her that Kaufman essentially kept her supplied with PTV to keep her from quitting and buy her silence about her even being there. In her last entries, it's clear that she was suffering from withdrawals. This is supported in a videotape we find that was most likely used to blackmail her, in case she decided to tell the authorities why they were keeping up a burned up little girl in their basement. Back in that room with the photo, we see a vision of Dahlia, Kaufman, and some other cult members discussing their plans for Alessa, saying that half her soul is lost, and their plans for rebirth have been stalled. Another flashback shows us Dahlia deciding to use Alessa in the rebirth of their cult god. In the end, we find Sybil holding Dahlia, a placid Alessa, and another figure in a wheelchair at gunpoint. Dahlia makes it clear that in order for this rebirth to be completed, Cheryl needs to be combined with Alessa. She represents a fraction of Alessa's soul that was split the day Dahlia chose to sacrifice her by burning her in some fucked up ritual to birth this god. Alessa knowingly did this to prevent that ritual from being completed. So all this work we've been doing for Dahlia was actually preventing Alessa from a accomplishing the one thing that would stop all this, her death. Dahlia was given those marks of Samael, a spooky name, so we would be afraid of them. But they were really the spell that would kill her. In the seven years that the two sides of this soul have been separated, Alessa has been stewing in the nightmare world we've been subjected to this whole time. With all manner of details having some analogous significance to her suffering and frustration, this is why we often see childish or benign things reflected in monstrous ways. Say like a lizard from a fairy tale, or cruel school children, or pretty nurses that don't have to deal with a body covered in scars. So now that her whole plan is thrown in the garbage, Alessa and Cheryl become one, creating a creature called the Incubator. Kaufman shows up, shoots Dahlia, and throws his vial of red shit from earlier. It's actually called Agleophotis, and was perhaps some kind of byproduct of PTV. I don't think it canonically has this name yet, so for now it's still just mysterious red shit. It's probably one of the only plot lines that rubs me the wrong way, both in story and gameplay. I always thought it would have made more sense to reverse the order that this liquid is used in, like having Kaufman actually throw this at Sybil when she was possessed in front of Harry, so both of us put together, okay, this stuff removes parasitic beings from you. So in that moment, we would know, hey, I have some of that stuff now that I somewhat understand its use and I'm not just taking a shot in the dark like, yeah, liquid. Oh, fuck, that worked? Either way, since what it appears to do is force things out of people, it has kind of the mixed bag result of expelling the god from the incubator. Once out, first order of business, set Dolly on fire. <laughs> like, first of all, fuck you. Harry unloads into it, destroying it, producing some sort of biological reset of Alessa and Cheryl in the form of an infant, which Harry picks up and, along with Sybil, escapes the crumbling nightmare. Kaufman tries to escape as well, but a vengeful Lisa jumps on him and traps him there. Like the 
fucking pricky is. After the credits, we see a parallel to the opening sequence where Harry and Sybil happily look at Cheryl Lessa. There is certainly confusion as to whether or not this is the canon ending. Masahiro Ito has stated that the regular good ending in which Sybil dies is the canon one, but Toyama seems to consider this one to be the real one. Either way, it's an ending. Another proves Harry's theory of being inside his own dream true, as we get a melancholic shot of him dead inside of his jeep at the beginning of the game. He could also be abducted by aliens. Welcome back, guys. You missed out on a lot there. I know, but uh, it's looking like we're going to run a little long tonight. Look, I'm not going to dick around with this. <laughs> I love this story. Not only for the rose-colored glasses I get to see it through, but for how it advanced narrative-driven horror games, the games its influence would produce, and its just enduring themes that I appreciate. A Lovecraftian blending of dreams and reality, cults operating in secret with mysterious motives, horror fashioned from atmosphere and the unknown, family drama, faith, loss, grief, betrayal, just depth in general. Plus, you have all this untapped, surreal influence from David Lynch, and Stephen King, and Jodorowsky, and Lewis Carroll, and it's far from spoon-fed to you. Half the shit I just said, I couldn't even tell you with utmost certainty. I'm sure parts are addressed in other games, or from the staff's Twitter accounts, but if we confine the story of Silent Hill down to this game, its purest, most distilled form. It's a beautifully weird, complex, depressing, and unnerving experience, and it still is, I think. I mean, there's a degree of wonder that's missing now that I better understand how games work, but guess what? Still cried, still had to take breaks every so often to calm my nerves. It's seemingly compiled of a sequence of equally striking and memorable moments that just wriggled their way into my head and stayed there, even the ones that seemed like non sequiturs or ideas lost in their own ambiguity. It's those missteps that only serve to flavor it define it. Once you inhabit this dream world with dream logic, you can say all sorts of things with imagery and atmosphere that would be awkward for characters to tell each other. Dream logic, which is an abstraction, it can say things that are difficult to say in words. Just like when you have a dream, so much understanding for you, but when you try to tell your friend, it's very difficult to say in words something that would give your friend the same experience you had. I keep trying to qualify this in my head as like, well, this was important to me, so I see these things. Like, I'm the one that opens the box in the attic, so now obviously I'm the one that Paulette's spirit has become attached to. I, I don't have blood right now, just fucking cool it. Play with your dolls, you creep. I'm trying to say, my opinion is tainted. So even though Silent Hill has been a widely respected game, things get old, they get forgotten, less and less people see the magic that I see. So if you thought this plot sounded too vague or poorly paced or performed, I don't have the strongest way of assuring you it's good other than it made me cry as a 10 year old boy. So that means it's good. Since reviews at the time couldn't avoid it, and I'm not clever enough to approach it from a different angle, I'll compare it to Resident Evil, a game I love almost equally, where Resident Evil essays you into the role of a trained soldier, more or less. I mean, look at this fucker. You know this guy has an NRA sticker on his pickup. In Silent Hill, you're just a dude. Regular citizen man. He reacts to things bravely, but with no more tactical or combat skills than your average person. This reflects in gameplay, because the act of killing something involves you a little more than in Resident Evil. Keep in mind I'm talking about the original 1 and 2. In that, Resident Evil has you kind of passively standing around, shooting at zombie heads until they explode. Whereas in Silent Hill, aiming weapons is intentionally unwieldy. Using melee weapons requires timing that is difficult to nail, so you're likely to hurt yourself in the process, and if you don't finish them off with a good whack to the head or stomping on them, they will get right back up. That touch alone makes the act feel visceral and personal almost. It feels like self-preservation instead of a methodical, tactical move. You spend most of the game sprinting through the moderately open world map of Silent Hill. It's probably best practice to avoid combat whenever possible, especially in the streets as defeating enemies there doesn't accomplish much aside from wasting your resources. And they're probably going to respawn anyway. Harry is visibly exhausted from doing this, and he can trip and fall down and enemies can knock him over or latch onto him. You're vulnerable. Even if you're like me and have memorized ammo locations and feel pretty prepared, you can't always predict how an encounter with an enemy will go. There is an unmatched feeling of relief when you've been booking it through the fog with your radio squealing away, telling you that there are several creatures of varying degrees of horrendousness nipping at your heels and you should not stop to confirm that and you make it inside somewhere and you are greeted with dead silence save for Harry's ragged breathing. 
oh, it's, it's so good. It brings to mind that feeling every time I come home at the end of the day, like, ha! Did it again. Another day wrestled out of the hands of this wretched earth. Sound is very important, and the implementation of the radio is still an inspired touch. You could also turn off your flashlight as enemies are attracted to it, but I'm gonna be real and say that the slight advantage you get to stealth is not worth running around in the goddamn dark like some kind of dummy. I say the game is mostly open world because it's more like it feels as though it's open world, but it's actually designed in a clever way that simulates exploration while it's pushing you in a fairly linear direction. I have a strong affection for the map, not only because I have a terrible sense of direction and was opening it every 20 seconds, but because it updates based on what you've explored. So if you run into a roadblock or a locked door, it adds a squiggly red line so you don't keep running in circles. You want to know the way to my heart, I'll tell you when I've located it, but you'd get close I think if you have a map like Silent Hill's map. There is some light puzzle work. None of it's overly complicated, but a few might have you doubting your intelligence for a moment or two. Otherwise, it's mostly a logical, well, dream logical series of find X to put in Y to get key. Both Resident Evil and Silent Hill have tank controls, which I know can be a deal breaker for some, but you know, it's a lot like getting into the ocean. You sort of just have to jump in, quickly deduce that it's the worst thing in the world, and then get the f Excessive pressure on the face is not desired. No, it's fine. It's, it's easy to understand after a while. You have the ability to reorient the camera angle, so, so I found it a lot more manageable and occasionally more atmospheric than the fixed camera angles in Resident Evil. Given that the game is fully 3D and not pre-rendered, there are some impressive cinematic camera angles that mirror crane shots and other little touches that make it feel like a film. This one in particular in the game's cold open was pretty life-changing, and I was just overjoyed to see it recreated in the film adaptation. I've mentioned it twice now, I, I have mixed feelings about that film, but one thing it did nail was the opening with the alleyway and the great children. I was fucking elated, but then they'd give that little girl dialogue or just do something so off the mark that I'd be out of it again. I don't know if I'll ever really understand my own feelings about that film. I'm sorry, like I needed more padding to this video. It is perfect. <laughs> I don't even care. Crucify me on a cross emblazoned with hashtag 90s kids. Cover me in a shroud of psychedelic triangles and squiggles. I get it. I like old things. Wow, let's all laugh at the sad nostalgia boy. Present day is so cool with all its shitty reboots and $80 early access experiments that imbeciles perpetuate by pre-order. I'm calm, I'm calm. At least we got ray tracing and VR. Sick. Now, honestly, I have a deep love for this generation of graphics and very specifically Silent Hill, because unlike other Resident Evil clones like, say, Dino Crisis or Martian Gothic, Silent Hill had real-time 3D environments instead of pre-rendered static backgrounds, which is for sure charming in its own way, but there is a certain grit and grain to Silent Hill's aesthetic that is just a very charming result of its limitation. This extends to its trademark fog and darkness, which was clearly devised as a way to mask a very short draw distance. But this works out perfectly because as someone who wears glasses, this is just how it looks for me all the time. And sometimes I think it's best that way. I'm better off not knowing what's more than two feet in front of me. But also, it adds another effective layer of unease to gameplay, forcing you to rely on your radio and creature sounds to act as your eyes, until you get close enough for some twisted fleshy creature to stumble out of the dark. The limited detail and heavily pixelated look to everything is really best in the other world, making rusty, grimy, blood-stained areas feel exceptionally unsanitary. I love the cutscenes as well, they still have so much expression and life to them. This guy was really good at capturing little specific emotions that you didn't see reflected in games. This is exemplified well by a faux blooper reel that plays after the end credits, where we see the game characters breaking the fourth wall as if they were actors in a film. And there's something really remarkable about how well human emotion is captured in a low-budget horror game from 1999. Especially when you consider they were created by one man who had to live in the dev team's office, rendering video three to four hours for every one second. Visually, I think the only real criticism I have is that the boss designs are far from the most noteworthy in the series. You got like a smooth lizard with a big mouth, a worm, a moth. Compared to the rest of the series, they get much better at the design and significance of these bosses. 
The final boss does win me back some though. It's just that the rest of these are kind of bland, especially when the designs of regular enemies are so effective. They're a good middle ground between recognizable and twisted into some fleshy abomination. Some of them, like the Romper, I didn't even entertain the idea of fighting. Just the moment they let out that horrendous giggle and bound towards you on all fours. I also routinely jumped every time an enemy called a Larval Stalker showed up, which, funnily enough, is not even a hostile creature, but it still sets off your radio and makes a very loud squeak noise while ambling towards you. Also, speaking of loud noises, I don't remember there being so many absolutely fucked jump scares. You know what I don't get? Sybil showed up from Brands, right? Like the next town over? As though she expected to arrive at a bustling active town? Wouldn't someone, the authorities, out of town relatives, someone had to have noticed that an entire town's population? <laughs> there is something really effective about a small, child-sized humanoid enemy. Certainly when it's combined with the grotesque, choking laugh sound they make. They all sound so happy and I don't like it. These enemies, the Grey Children, were notoriously censored in Europe and Japan, as they too closely resembled children, and people don't like it when you hit children with pipes. In those versions, they are replaced by another enemy called a Mumbler, which looks slightly more inhuman. But kinda makes no sense. You, you telling me if you saw this fucker running at you, you wouldn't beat it to death with a lead pipe? It goes without saying that the sound design and music are near unparalleled. There are horror games now that don't even approach the rich, erotic, and inventive use of sound in this 20 year old game. Well, one of those words may have been an autocorrect error. I would not describe something as rich. The fact that you think I would is rich. You know what I'm saying? Everything does it for me. The clank of footsteps on metal grating, getting a good whack in with a melee weapon, the droning ambience, the sound of distant sirens, the different flavors of radio static. Like it's all beautifully, beautifully ugly and unpleasant. It's the best. Everything sounds disgusting. Voice acting got a lot of shit from critics, which I understand. Do you know anything about... Well, like some other world? It's like some kind of bad dream. I think it's incredibly charming and well performed, but it does have this very specific pacing that you could either read as awkward or dreamlike. Everyone has this kinda confused, I just woke up and the world is ending but I haven't quite decided if I'm still dreaming sound to their voice. It's like this is all some kind of bad dream. Yeah, a living nightmare. I think Harry, Sybil, and Lisa sound the most like real people. Harry, this whole thing's been a major blow to you. You need to rest. Kaufman sounds like an anime character. Unless you want to die, keep your mind on business. And Dahlia just really goes for it. It's a lovably over-the-top performance. The demon is awakening, spreading those wings. They're all, they're all great. They're all classic. Classic voice work. Um... This is a pretty uh, perfect soundtrack. Like the Silent Hill games are kind of the gold standard to me as far as quality soundtracks. Especially when you compare it to the sort of by the numbers cinematic score that other games were going for. Yamaoka would go for something that paired with the game's cold rusty visuals. Landing on industrial, citing influences like Coil, Nitzer Ebb, and The Killing Joke to capture the many urgent dread inducing moments. And to match some of the more Lynchian imagery, there is clear reverence for frequent Lynch collaborator Angelo Badalamenti. There are also some tracks that I couldn't even uh, casually listen to ever because they are so effectively unnerving and instantly incite panic within me. Like they sometimes play tracks like this during puzzles where you're not really in any danger and it still had me sweating, desperately wanting to get the fuck out of that room. You got a number of guitar-driven, trip-hop sort of songs that draw from the likes of Portishead and Massive Attack. They had a lot of heart, and I'm a big fan of the layer of crackling vinyl warmth applied to them. It's 
It's like no moment is wasted musically. Every scene is an opportunity for a banger. It's, it's untouchable, you can't touch it, unless it's with another Silent Hill soundtrack. But even then, it's gotta be very gentle and you do not make eye contact with it. So the good news is that there were surprisingly few overtly negative reviews to be found for Silent Hill. As it should be, of course, but I mean, it is the internet, so. Ultra lame. I love video games, especially when they're creepy, but this game just bites. The gameplay is lame. The characterization is less than interesting. And all you do is run around forever and nothing interesting happens. I say if you want a good game, don't buy this one. I suggest looking through a walkthrough or just committing to something in your life more strongly. Clearly you couldn't figure out where to go so you gave up. And I just hope that ideology hasn't informed the rest of your life. I want you to get better, I want you to get up off your feet, I want you to do something, I want you to make something of yourself. Then you get back to Silent Hill and uh, you tell me why you were wrong. Not what I was expecting. The graphics are horrible. Yes, it's an old game, but you can barely see anything. More annoying than scary, don't waste your money. See. It just makes me sad that we can't experience the same things. I see darkness or some kind of obscurity and my brain cycles through possibilities of what could be in there. And that's infinitely more terrifying than knowing what I should be worried about. I think your brain just might be a dumb person's brain. The ending sucks! I think this game itself was okay, but I have to say that I was very disappointed about the ending though. I hated it! It- Oh shit, somebody gotta check on Sabrina. I think she was so scared by the game she had a heart attack. Either that or her computer time for the day was up. This is 2019. I must be spoiled. Trying to play this game is an absolutely aggravating experience. The keyboard controls are clunky beyond belief. I gave up in utter frustration after an hour of trying to move around and defend myself. This thing is rated as the best horror survival game in existence? BS! The dialogue and writing is just awful. The soundtrack is a joke. The graphics suck beyond belief. Okay, sure. It was made in 1899, so I understand that. But from what I saw in an hour, the horror level is laughable. Nothing was there to create horror. Everything about this damned game created annoyance. Right off the bat, you mentioned keyboard controls, which uh, under no circumstances should you be playing this game with a keyboard. That sounds like a needless frustration you've given yourself. So immediately you've invalidated your opinion because you've picked up something old that you didn't pay for and then went on the internet to complain that it's old. Like what games do you like? I'm gonna I'm I'm a dig a little deeper down this rabbit hole. I, I'm not even gonna touch on that. <laughs> okay, so believe it or not, there will come a day when someone will look at Call of Duty Black Ops 2 and say, okay, sure, it was made in 2000 whatever, but it sucks beyond belief. Maybe that day will be today. And maybe I will be the one who says it. So, I'm looking at this. And I see a pic of a boat. What the hell does a boat have to do with this game? I hate boats. I was gonna buy a new sealed copy. Now I won't because of this boat. Thanks. You got me there. I don't really have a witty rejoinder to that. Something really bad happened on a boat and I, I hope you've received help for it. Boats are just the worst though. I, 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 I agree. Well, to sum up, game is good. It's still good. I, I think it really holds up. The biggest hurdle in revisiting it is getting used to tank controls and some of the requirements for the better endings. I'd be impressed if you could figure them out unassisted on your first playthrough. It's unfortunate that Silent Hill was often compared to Resident Evil because it wasn't made to mimic or leech off Resident Evil's success despite the higher ups at Konami fully intending that. Team Silent crafted Silent Hill in response to Resident Evil in an effort to show that video games could do more than mimic bad Bad films. They, they could mimic good films. I have a lot of love for the first three Resident Evil games, but I know they weren't complex. They weren't trying to say anything other than zombie bad, solve puzzle, shoot zombie. And you know what? It did a fantastic job of saying that, but it's been saying that for nigh upon two decades. Silent Hill was this rebellious anomaly that I doubt could be repeated. A team of unproven developers at one of the most notoriously cruel and out of touch companies in the industry taking a bland corporate move and pushing for something that wouldn't just be 
contributing to a fad. The plan was always for it to stand the test of time, and still be a work of art years later, and I think they absolutely accomplished that. There is a genuine creative joy to this game, and indeed with the other games Team Silent would produce, that I don't think Western developers were ever able to truly recapture. I don't think you can replicate that with a council of developers shown Silent Hill, given a dump truck of money, and told to make another one of those abstract, atmospheric games that somewhat tried to mimic Western culture based on what they observed in Twin Peaks. One of the things that pushed me to talk about Silent Hill, even though it terrified me, was while I was replaying it, a rumor started getting spread around that Konami, after letting the franchise languish in the form of pachinko machines, announcing a new entry with a very well-received demo that was cancelled because it was too good an idea, could possibly be working on two Silent Hill games, one being a soft reboot and the other being an episodic experience in the style of a Telltale sort of game, which obviously has worked out well for them. At the time of my making this video, Konami has not actually confirmed these rumors, but they have issued a response that they are listening to customer feedback and considering ways to provide the next title in the Silent Hill series. So I guess my feedback is Silent Hill exists because you got out of the way of some really creative people. It has created this legacy despite your efforts to prevent that from happening. So the next time a respected, maybe a little eccentric developer with some wild ideas and expensive taste in cameos offers to make a game for you and just the idea of it is so widely beloved that people were buying consoles to preserve the memory of a fucking playable teaser. Maybe just take a step back. Remember, hey, we still got pachinko machines. We're still going to get money. <laughs> We still got money! We're still on top of the world, baby! Maybe we let people have what they want just this once. Maybe it'll make everybody happy. Like at this point, anything short of PT's promise or the return of Team Silent is not going to be all that exciting. There's a lot of goodwill that needs to be reinstated. And quite honestly, I don't see that being reinstated. Unless you start seeing games as, uh, as art and entertainment instead of a very long straw going into somebody's pocket. I do think it should be a Japanese team that handles it though. Like, none of the games from Western developers feel as atmospheric or otherworldly. Like, the opening to Homecoming is just a scene from Jacob's Ladder. I, I w we understand the inspiration, but we don't know how to do anything creative with it. Oh, you guys liked Jacob's Ladder? Well, here is a different part of that movie. I don't know, I lost sight of where I was going with this, but Silent Hill is a good game. It's got a wonderfully weird and abstract plot with some strong emotional beats to it. Beautiful design all around. Gameplay is good, but dated, and that might be a turnoff. Also, if graphics are a deciding factor in your enjoyment of a game. It's an old game, but uh, I love it. If you like video games and art, you should play it sometime. Thank you, and I'm sorry. Hey guys, um, I'm a little tired from talking for so long, but thank you for watching my video. And special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Joyful Beard, Daniel Person, Joseph Zanoni, Alexander Smith, Nylanthrope, Dylan Sorum, Octo, Charles Marr, Dark Raptor 86, Karen Mavel, Newstime, Mr. Benjamin, Dos Days, The Steel's Getting Worse All the Time, Game Master, Nazim Kamalu Ray, Oisto, Alexander Sundin, but you're brown. <laughs> and Resurrection for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. I, there were more names this time than the last time. You guys are crazy. Thank you so much for supporting me and allowing me to make a, a feature length video on a game you probably know uh, everything about already. But it means the world to me that I'm allowed to do that and also feed myself at the same time. I, I, I appreciate the heck out of all of you. I'm very tired from talking. Um, but but I, I hope you're all doing well. Here's a song. <laughs>